Hey everyone, um, thanks very much for coming. Well done for making it through. I know this is one of the final sessions of the event. Um, I'm afraid that I lured you into this room uh, with talk of ecosystems and the Lego group, and now I'm gonna hit you with a bit of discussion about compliance and regulation, but I try, will try my best to make it interesting and hopefully you can get something from it. Um, in all seriousness, today we're gonna, I'm gonna be walking through um, some areas we think are really important, um, uh, very important areas of the gaming landscape, of the digital landscape in general. Um, we view that collaboration um, and, and kind of interaction between uh, gaming companies and platforms is, is the only way to improve the ecosystem for players in some of these areas. So we're really passionate about building the right tools and, 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 and services um, to allow that to happen. And I will be highlighting how in particular we've got partners like the Lego Group that are kind of on this journey to improve the landscape with us. Um, who am I? Uh, my name's Paul Nunn. I'm Chief Strategy Officer and Head of Developer Relations at Super Awesome, an Epic Games company. So uh, we're part of the wider tool set that, that Epic offers out to developers. Um, our focus has always been since, since uh, 2013 when we were founded um, to help developers with the tools and services they require to manage youth audiences. So our part of the landscape is to think about mixed audience games or, or games in general where youth audiences are a part of, a part of the mix. Um, what makes youth audiences different? So why is there a set of tools required or a set of uh, a different set of uh, thoughts and thinking around these audiences? Well, mostly because of the legislation, because of the protections that these audiences are, are kind of covered by in terms of the regulators. So um, I've highlighted a couple of the main regulations there. You've obviously got the copper legislation and the, the GDPR uh, in Europe. Um, these are very common uh, legislations, cover, cover lots of different audiences, but in the case of copper, very much focused on youth audiences. These really necessitate compliant practice and, and they kind of mandate additional tools and services to, to help uh, developers and, and platforms to manage them. And it's really an evolving landscape that is changing very, very rapidly. So, you know, I could have put you know, 20 more flags on this screen of, of current legislation or impending legislation in discussion that is kind of really creating a very uh, swiftly moving landscape of, of things that, and considerations that developers need to think about. And so we're trying to aid developers by building tools to help with that kind of swirling complexity that goes on around legislation with audience management. Um, how does, it, how does this really impact developers? So what are the tools that we're producing for? Where, where, where does this show itself? So, I think where you, where you get this, uh, this interaction is really in, in the tools and in the games and in the services. So if you're a developer, you're aiming to build the best uh, quality uh, game you can, delight your users, you're really focusing on um, how you can make the best experience for your players. And you're doing that via a number of different features and functionality, most commonly, you know, very, very common now to have lots of these features that are on the screen in your games from social and community features to chat functionality to account systems for persistent identity, geolocation services in the case of some mobile games. Um, lots of this stuff is very, very common. And when you're, when you're interacting or when you've got an audience who is a youth audience, depending on the market, that depends on the age that we're talking about here. But if you, in general, if you've got a youth audience member, you, there is certain ways that you need to think about that audience member as different to the rest of your users. And that's because of the legislation and where it interacts with uh, your uh, necessitate certain things because of the collection of data. So really these features and functionality allow uh, require the collection of personal information, personally identifiable information, or they, um, are, they allow the sharing of that information by the user. And there's lots of other considerations around these user groups, but this is the primary area where the law is, is covering. And, and they require something called verifiable parental consent in a number of cases, or in a lot of cases. And this is, this is the area we're building tools because it's very difficult for a developer to tackle this stuff and to think about this complexity themselves. So our, our suite of tools, the stuff that, that we produce, kids' web services as we term it, um, effectively, there are, there are lots of things that we, we produce, but we produce two main modules that cover consent management and parent verification. They're the two pieces, if you like, of uh, delivering verifiable parental consent for a developer and therefore allowing them to have, you know, safely interact with, with a youth audience in their game or in their platform. Um, I thought it was worth covering off why we think this is important. Uh, I think is. There's a number of reasons why we are focused on this area and why we see it as a real fundamental key to building a, a safer and a, a better landscape. The first one is um, with the complexity surrounding the privacy legislation and, and, and really with the friction that the VPC process uh, introduces for the player, developers can often avoid uh, engaging with youth audiences, you know, increasingly under 16 year olds. And, and um, 
Usually they're doing this because they, they don't want to act badly. They, they fear inappropriately collecting data. They don't want, a lot of cases, don't have the resources to kind of tackle these issues and understand what they're dealing with. Um, but this has several effects. So there are lots of knock-on effects if a developer decides to remove features for a youth audience member or they uh, in, entirely re restrict the service when they don't need to, of course. Some services aren't aimed at kids, but when they don't need to restrict that audience, um, there, are, there are lots of knock-on effects. First of all, the audience misses out, right? You, you, you miss out on lots of players coming into your game or your account system and using your service who probably would really be valuable users and would love it. And um, in the worst case, it can lead to the, to the, to the thing that we don't want, which is, which is users misrepresenting their age and then ending up in services with the, with the developer not understanding or knowing their true age in, in the systems that they're collecting data in. Um, the second reason is, is that they are valuable. You know, increasingly, the legislation is kind of broadening and interacting with more markets and developers have to face that its, its audience is under 16 and could even stretch to under 18. You know, this is going to be uh, an issue that developers, a lot of developers are going to want to take care of over because um, you don't want to miss out on valuable players. If you're building an account system, if you're thinking about you know, uh, the, the way that you interact across numerous titles, you really want as many users as you can in a lot of cases. And, and these users, if you talk about like a 15-year-old uh, in a lot of markets, they're really engaged. They're really good players. They're really good users. And by the way, they're building brand loyalty. They're building, you know, an association to games. I'm sure a lot of us did as well at that age. And so you kind of, you want to draw those audiences into your account system. Um, not many account systems want to be ignoring a big chunk of one of the fastest growing audiences on the internet. Um, and the last thing is uh, we, we provide these solutions because there is a growing need. I talked about the fact that there's a lot more legislation out there, but there are also a lot more games, a lot more of these features and functionality are woven in, you know, cross-play, um, social uh, interactivity in games. It's getting more and more and more prevalent, and we need to think, we, we think about that because there is a need for a global solution. All of our technology is translated in some 16 markets who have enormous products globally because there is going to be more and more need for a solution to come in and remove some of the friction that players feel and that parents feel in this process and, and um, ensure that we cover off developers with the right set of tools. So I'll briefly cover off what, what these tools actually look like in practice. So these are the two core areas. Once again, we've got um, consent management and the parent verification. Consent management should be very easy for us to understand because I'm sure every one of us has interacted with this a great deal for ourselves. You know, uh, a, a service or a game has to provide um, evidence that you've given consent or you've given permission for them to collect your data. In the case of a youth audience, they are not, they are below the age of digital consent. They can't give that permission. So the parent has to come in and say, yep, yeah, I'm fine uh, for, for you, uh, game developer, to collect my, my child's email address to create an account or to collect their data and, 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 and they're hap I'm happy for them to use your service. So um, we've mocked up a, a fictional game company here. It's a couple of screens that navigate through to the to the, to the parent to say, hey, are you okay with your, the data collection that's being requested here? This isn't really the problem. This is where you get more of a problem because this is where the law mandates in, in several markets. It's not good enough for you to just get, get consent. You then have to provide evidence through verification that the person giving you that consent is an adult. Because if you don't do that, then the, parent, then the child could set up their own consents, they could set up their own parent controls, they can kind of do uh, everything that they want on their, without their parent being involved whatsoever. So when you uh, get to the, the screens here with verification, what, what is required is the parent to engage with some kind of verification method and provide evidence that they're an adult. And this is really a problem. I've, I've put reduced flow here because there's obviously several more screens, at least three in that section there where the parent has to get through these screens to, to provide evidence via a verification method. And, and so really how I would describe the situation is should look a bit more like this. You know, consent management is understandably a module that's required and lots of services will provide it, but parent verification is kind of this prickly, frictionful, difficult piece of the landscape. And this is the, the core area where I think we can only get through this if we collaborate as, a, as an ecosystem. Um, so how do, how do we look to improve this situation? So we've just shown a lot of screens that the parent needs to get through, necessary screens for the legislation. Quite rightly, there's friction there because that provides a way for, for us to safely navigate with parents involved in their kids' digital lives. But how do we improve the situation? Well, well, firstly, there's some basic stuff. So the first thing is 
you know, we need to communicate really well. So we spend a lot of time thinking about UI to speak to parents and, and lots of our partners do too, to, to educate them why this is necessary. You know, why are we asking for, the, for the, you know, their credit card details? Why are we asking for them to, for, to provide the last four digits of their social security number? It's because the law mandates that we do that and we protect their, the information that's gathered from their children. So in order, to, in order to improve the landscape, the first thing we need to do also is to uh, give every parent um, the ability to make the verific verification choice they're most happy with. You know, we, through our Kids Web Services tools, we aggregate the best methods of verification that are compliant with the legislation that we possibly can. So we've got a number of different solutions. You know, we offer a face scan in, in lots of markets outside the US currently. Um, so the parent can just scan their face for, a, for a, an age estimation that will provide verification. We've obviously got stuff like payment card and social security number, last four digits of social security number, as I mentioned, identity card scan. So we aggregate these sources together. The idea here is that um, we don't make the choice for any of our partners. So a developer who uses our tools and software, they, um, you know, they configure these different verification options as they see fit, and they roll them out as they see fit. It's their, their decision here. But we aggregate the methods at the back end and provide them. Um, and the reason that this is important is because parents have a very different view uh, individually about what is the best way for them to verify. Some people would be totally fine with providing a credit card once they've read the details of why we're asking. Other people would be much, much happier with an identity card scan or a face scan. So we don't make that choice for the parent. We just offer them a set of solutions that they can choose. And we're always adding to these. So we really, you know, this is an ongoing kind of uh, project for us to aggregate as many verification methods as we can, keeping up to date with the legislators and working to help improve the choice available to parents and developers. Um, but the second piece is, is really what I wanted to focus on today. So the second, the second area that we can really improve the landscape is via a piece of technology that we call the parent graph. And this is really based on collaboration. And this is where we come uh, to our friends, the Lego group, because it's here that we're able to really give you an example of how um, this kind of collaboration between the two of us, and hopefully uh, in the future, many more uh, partners, along with the ones that we already have, is really going to help. This is how we're going to help the landscape. So uh, Lego, um, Lego group, I'm sure lots of you know them. Um, for 90 years, the Lego group has inspired generations of children through play. The company is a leader in defining safe digital play experiences for children. They have tons of experiences, tons of products and activities in this area. And um, the partnership that we have with the Lego group is really based on a mutual objective to improve the VPC process and to improve the experience for players and parents who interact with both of our, our services and games. So to give you an example and to show you how this works, um, this is the situation. So uh, when a, a player uh, under the age of digital consent creates an Epic account, they're required to have their parent or guardian go through VPC, as I've explained, to verify they're an adult. So we've got that friction, but we end up with the, the parent managing to pass verification. Um, the Lego group do this too. So they do this exact process. Here I've shown, again, a, a slightly reduced flow for a parent to uh, log in and provide consent and uh, verification within the uh, Lego Life app. And you see here that there's the same friction, there's exactly the same process, the law is the same, and, and they're going about it in a really good way. The communication is excellent to the parent here, and, and, but they're really looking to uh, enforce the regulation and be compliant with, with what's going on. So now we have a situation where the same parent has a child that uses both service, services potentially. And I would say there's, a, there's a, a good deal of children that are in that bucket and parents who are, who are faced with this. But, wouldn't it be fantastic if we were able to remove the fact that the parent has to do this multiple times, the verification step? Um, that's exactly what we do with the parent graph. So effectively, to be clear, the, the consent management piece is still per product and per service. Of course, the parent still needs to give permission for their, parent to, uh, for their child to use the different services in, individually. But we can at least remove the verification piece. So we can really smooth out the user journey for parents who, who, who interact here. And, it works both ways. So uh, wherever a parent first interacts with that verification process and provides the evidence they're an adult, that's the last time they, they have to do that in this ecosystem that we're creating. So we're basically shredding the amount of data collected from the parent by ensuring that the uh, parent only has to verify once. And that's what the parent graph is aiming to do. It only requires the parents to verify their adult status once. Um, and this is actually the key to why collaboration is, is truly required to improve the ecosystem, because we're only going to collaborate. If we collaborate together, we can make this happen. Um, it's a tool, the parent graph is a tool that allows us to, to verify adult status once, and it is essentially an anonymous network of pre-verified parents. So 
Um, how does it work? So if I run through a diagram very briefly about how the parent graph will actually uh, operate, we've built it completely transparently. Um, it's built for a very singular purpose. It doesn't do anything else for us. It doesn't have any other purpose other than the purpose that I've just discussed about smoothing out the user journey for parents. And it works like this. So if you are a new parent, uh, you've come into an ecosystem, our ecosystem because you've, you, we've got your email. We need to provide verification for the person attached to that email. Then we create a one-way encrypted hash of your email address immediately. Um, we then check it against the parent graph database. If the, if the entry is there, then we'll go into that. But basically, what happens if you're not in the parent graph, if we haven't got that one-way encrypted hash code in our database, then we pass you through the standard verification methods that I've just outlined, and you provide evidence that you're an adult. Once you are successfully through the verification process, we store your hash along with several pieces of anonymous information, stuff like the method of verification that you chose, the country that you're in, the timestamp of when you did it, so we can allow people to move out of the parent graph after a certain period of time. Um, but that's all we store. It's completely anonymous. We can't you know, send you an email down the line. We don't have your email. We just have a one-way encrypted hash, which we can utilize only for the purpose of taking a look to see if we've already got it. And that's exactly what we do. So you, the start of this process, we one-way encrypted hash, the email address of the parent, if the parent is, if that hash is in our database, then we can entirely skip the process um, which is outlined on the previous screens. And, and that is um, an enormous amount of friction removed. So the best way, in our view, to, to improve the landscape is to just not show the screens, to not have the parent required to put their credit card details or their social security number in. And that's exactly what happens. So the parent, in a situation where they've already verified before, using a service that uses our tools, they will just click verify I'm an adult and then they will receive a thank you very much for verifying. And that's it, that's in between there'll be nothing else. There'll be an email sent to them which is part of the legislation, but really their journey through this process is a lot easier. Um, and so why is this important though? Like we've just talked about uh, how ourselves and the Lego group are working on this. We've got many other partners. Another one there is, is shown on screen among us, a really high number of users playing a fantastic game there. Um, but really, this problem could be really, really huge and will be really, really huge. So I've talked about the fact the evolution of the landscape in terms of privacy uh, regulation is, is rumbling on and more and more developers, more and more games, more and more account systems. This will deluge users and players. It will keep a lot of users out of, of games. It will keep a lot of users out of account systems un, unnecessarily. Uh, and it will create an enormous amount of friction in the process. So really, the, the solution is, is, is that we can, can have an enormous impact through this as we aggregate more and more services and we talk to more and more partners and, and more people kind of buy into this idea that something like the parent graph will be uh, a necessity to smooth out the friction that's here. Um, and the benefit that I'm talking about, the, the, the interesting piece of this is that um, we've um, talked a lot about the user journey. We've talked a lot about how parents uh, require this service, how um, it can, it really is a necessity to try and smooth out friction, but developers are the ones that benefit too. This is really an ecosystem benefit, we would say, uh, from the parent graph, because more, uh, more parents through VPC means more players in games. And this is, this is, this is what's happening right now. So KWS and our, the parent graph have been running for a number of years now. Um, there are currently 11 million parents, over 11 million parents in the parent graph right now, already pre-verified and gone through that verification process, which is a very large number. And it, even at this early stage, it has a dramatic impact. If a new product launches or a new game launches, we've seen partners have an increase of 20 to 30 percent on the conversion rate through the, the parent verification process because the parent graph is there to aid uh, and to remove some of the friction that's required from parents. Um, Really, um, in summary, I think it, we see the parent graph and, and collaboration on tools like the parent graph to benefit everyone in the ecosystem. It's going to drastically reduce the amount of data that's collected in these processes that are required by law in, in many markets. You know, the, the benefit will be felt by players primarily and, and by, by their parents, but it will also be felt by, by the ecosystem in terms of developers and in terms of everyone. Um, and really, stuff like this, we would say, it's a very practical you know, technology and collaboration tools like the parent graph we see as a, a step towards inclusiveness and, a, and, and kind of improved player experience that we feel would be kind of part of what is being described as the metaverse. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like, just like to say that uh, all of the tools that I've talked about, any developer or platform can use all of the tools that I've talked about 
uh, freely, you have access to the parent graph freely. We make it completely available via dev portals and everything else and via our direct team. Uh, and it's entirely free, so there's no commercial uh, element to this whatsoever. We don't charge anything for any of the, you, any of the tools that I've described here and many more, and we provide a lot of stuff like parent support and, and things like that down the road too. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>